I'm Jim Henderson, I'm the IT Director for Luxa Enterprises. Uh, bringing on device is a really interesting subject, you're completely correct. Uh, I've actually discussed it with, we have a Sprint and a few other carriers, and I've actually discussed it with our Sprint rep herself that that's one of the big questions that people have all the time. So I recently went to a convention and, and talked to a whole bunch of IT people and I got a little bit of statistics and information and I decided just to go with a presentation that's kind of out there that people are using and um, and kind of talk about how it fits. I, I love the open, hey wait, what did you just say? What did that mean? How does that affect me? Um, please interrupt me. I'm much better interactive than I am just rolling, so let me know what you need. So really, in Bring Your Own Device, um, it's the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. Um, this is kind of the truth. Um, <laughs> if you don't have users that are walking around carrying their own devices in and playing the, the only way I'm going to get this done is if I use my own device because the one they gave me doesn't do whatever. Uh, that's a common theme and the most frustrating thing in the world as an IT director because that means I'm failing at doing something. So. Um, so what exactly is it? Uh, 1.2 billion smartphones and tablets are predicted to be sold by end of 2013. That's actually incorrect. They already passed that number on, in the late October. They are flying out the doors. So what, it, what is a, um, first of all, when you refer to device, what are we talking about? It doesn't always mean cell phone. Um, it doesn't always mean a tablet. It can be a PC, it can be anything. When I walked in the door, I actually had told um, Fraka this morning, I was laughing because I was like, there's a stat later that talks about how many mobile devices does, a per does each person have. I'm like, each person? They have a device. No, they, they have more. I actually have three on me right now that are connected to the Wi-Fi in this building. And I, when I walked in, last time I was here, I guess they connected. And so for grins, I picked them up, and sure enough, they connected again. So uh, who buys devices? This is probably a question, depending on what kind of business you have, um, who buys the devices? 81% um, of Americans using their mobile devices for work. Uh, a lot of companies like to subsidize them, a lot of them like to buy them direct. It's kind of a which direction you want to go, what kind of control do you want to have is what this question is all about. So um, <laughs> I kind of laugh at this. Only 21% of companies reimburse employees when they bring their own devices that are expected to be used at work. So uh, the question is what does that do to employees and what does it make employees feel like? Again, you see 72% employers don't, re don't reimburse employees for data usage. We have an interesting policy. Um, um, I'm not sucking up, I actually was impressed. Fraka um, has a really cool policy. We actually cover data for our users, and then we add phone on. Because what do we really want our employees to have their mobile devices for? We want them to have their mobile devices so they can email, so they can communicate, so they can do the standard things that are pretty much the way people communicate now. So um, policies are kind of what this whole thing is all about. The ugly is, of course, as you know, you know this, cell bills can get out of control. So you really want to make sure you can get, you, if you work deals, you can get cell phone bills that are, range from 50 to three, four hundred dollars a month. So you really want to make sure that you have rules and expectations for people on what they can get and specific policies written. Um, this is a really cool stat that I actually checked a few places. More than one company actually had it. Samsung is the first place I found it, so I sourced them. But 78% of employees don't want to carry two devices. If they have a device and they don't have it, and they have a company device, they actually prefer to get rid of the company and keep their private. So you'll see people carrying both around, and generally they're not enjoying that. So what is the right policy? Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? This is the stat I was referring to. 3.3 uh, devices per worker by 2014. Evidently, I'm nerdier than I want to be because I have four on me right now. <laughs> and, we're all, and all of them are connected to this building. So uh, as you walk around, you, you'll find employees will have their cell phone. They'll have a tablet. They'll have a PC. They may have a business tablet. So you can have a whole bunch of devices all connected. That opens up a bunch of risks. We'll talk about later security risks. It opens up uh, performance on your network. Uh, it opens up legal ramifications. What are they doing with those devices that are not part of work, that are now in, involved in your network? Um, also, you want to leave enough selection for employees. Um, one of the really nice things about bring your own device versus purchasing devices is end users, in fact, I was just talking with Kelsey, um, End users tend to like a certain type of device. I 
have been a fan of a certain provider, a phone provider, for, uh, not carrier, provide a hardware maker for some time because little add-ons that they tweak. If you have an iPhone, it's an iPhone. If, you have a, if you're an Android fan, they tweak it a little bit. So like Samsung, HTC, they all have slight quirks to do it. Um, carriers then, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, they all do slight things to their phones. So which ones have those features that users may or may not like? Um, kind of through this one, it doesn't totally fit the statistic, but it was very interesting. 37% of employees do not activate their auto lock feature. If you pick up my phone right now, it will take, it'll start showing your face. If you are not me, if it's not my face and it says recognize and unlocks, it saves that picture and emails it to me. So if you pick up my phone and you try to unlock it with your face, I'll get a picture, I'll get an email of you almost immediately. So, um, yes, I'm a nerd, <laughs> okay? So, some of those things just happen. Okay. Um, this is notorious for people like me. I, um, it's re sometimes you want to put out bring your own device policies because you're like, oh my gosh, we need to protect our company and we need to do it today. The reality is it's happening in your company. If you don't have policies yet, you do not need to implement a policy tomorrow. You probably need to implement one pretty quickly, but you don't need to implement one tomorrow. Make sure that you know the ramifications of what you're going to run into. Um, people are using, 67% of people are using those devices at your place now already. So if you don't know about it, they're there, they're doing it. You're probably doing it. <laughs> and you're going, like, what are those people doing? And then you've got your phone and are doing it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, the employee role. Um, this should scare you. 77% of employees have no idea, they've not been educated, they don't know what's going on with Bring Your Own Device. They don't know why it's bad, they don't know what affects it. A great example that pretty much everyone should understand, Netflix. It is not abnormal for people to pop up Netflix on their phone. Hey, it's lunchtime, I'm just going to watch this Netflix just during lunch, I'm not going to take my work time. Well, that just, Netflix is um, a burst data. It, takes over that network by one cell phone on the Wi-Fi will now take over your entire network for 15, 20 minutes. And you can wipe out an entire network connection just with one user. So making sure users understand is really what this policy is about. It's not so much to hold people down, it's more to make sure you know we're working together on it. Um, this was really a cool stat. 6.8 million <coughs> devices were activated on Christmas Day last year that were either iOS or, or Android, the two major, and that's, hit the wrong button there. Um, it's, it's very interesting that you'll, I, I can't remember the statistical number, but it, it's in the high 80s percentage of the devices going out now are either Android or iOS. So depending on whether, if you talk to a nerd, we're going to tell you there's more Android phones sold. If you talk to anybody else, we're going to tell you there's more iPhone sold. So mm -hmm. I'll stick with my side. Mm -hmm. um, You're accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Worldwide, it's three to one. Yep. Is it? Mm -hmm. It's a very, uh, I just went to a um, convention that was totally computer based. And uh, the presenter, the, the keynote presenter, said, I want to show you guys something very interesting about computer people. And he said, okay, how many people have iPhones in here? And like, maybe 5% of people raising their hand. How many people have Androids? Like the whole room raising their hand. He said, welcome to the computer world. <laughs> we kind of have a differing opinion. Um, it's really about those device guidelines we're talking about there, making sure that people understand. Um, more than 10 billion personal devices expected to be in use by 2020. How many people are in the world? We have a lot of lot of devices going on there. We're kind of addicted to our technology. And then the part that's hard for people like me, I love to be a controller. I love to make sure that things are secure and safe, so I don't want people to have devices out there that aren't what they are. The reality is I'd love to say, no, you can't use an iPhone because I don't know how to support you as well as I do on an Android. But then the end users may be better with Android, and it may save you a lot of time, which we'll talk about here shortly. <coughs> so what's the impact on IT? This is when we're going to talk about that. Um, devices cause a lot of support for your IT department, and if you don't have an IT department, that's actually a bigger deal than if you do have an IT department. If you have an IT department, you can push them and make them deal with it. If you don't have an IT department, um, you run into the, how am I going to make sure that my users can get their email, their email crashed? How am I going to get their email back on their device? They can't browse this website because some feature doesn't work. Uh, there's a carrier, not you, that um, mm -hmm. blocks a bunch of corporate um, access and you have to buy a certain package to get it. Mm -hmm. Didn't even know that happened until we had bought about 50 devices that can't get through that, that can't use our some of our systems. So it became a major setup. So having a device that we can control was great for that. But if I do bring your own device, how do I make sure that users have the right information and the right um, standards? So, oh yeah. <laughs> we don't want to abandon these users 
Um, we want to allow support. Um, I think this is interesting. 84% of businesses both allow and support employee-owned devices. We do, on our side, we are very careful about it um, because you're also saying that means if I have to hold your device in my hand and you have your personal information on it, are there legal ramifications? Because now everything you have is in my hand and I can see it. So you have to be very careful. There's a lot of HR rules that are way outside my scope to talk about that you need to know for your policy. Um, there are a lot of security issues that you need to know. Um, we don't allow our help desk people to ask for your passwords. If you, if you have a lock code on your phone, we hand it to you and say, please do your code, and then we take it back. If they say, oh, here it is, they did it. Don't, I don't want to know your code. If you tell me, I'm gonna make you change it. <laughs> I don't want to know. So there's that. Um, this was really cool. 45% of users will attempt to repair their own phone before requesting help, while 88% say the phone belongs to the company, the company needs to provide help. So that opens up, that's a good and a bad. If you are trying to, if you, let's say you don't have an IT and you don't want to have to pay for support every time somebody breaks their phone, if they own their own device, they feel a little more obligated to take care of it. At the same time, are those people, salespeople that should be selling, are they um, people that have a profit-centric job versus um, one that could sit there and spend the time on that? Because you don't want them, you don't want a salesperson spending time repairing their phone when they should be communicating with people. Let's see here. Oh yes, um, this is this this might be solely for me. Please don't overwhelm IT people. If you are if you have an IT staff, um, it is amazing how much of our time is spent on mobile devices. A lot of the time, it starts with it's a computer issue, but then as we find out, oh wow, the real the real problem is when they do something on their phone, it causes that computer issue, or they plug their phone into the computer, and now that's why their whatever application or software stopped working on their mobile or on their personal desktop. So. That was actually interesting if you have an IT department. If you don't, 35% of third-party IT support companies are not supporting BYOD anymore. If you don't have a company policy that says this device, that device, that device, they're saying, I, we can't support your users because we don't know what we're going to get, and it will cost us more money than it's worth. The soft cost of supporting it is too much money. There's some other benefits, though. Okay, so security. <coughs> this is where I get really excited. So security is a big deal, and I apologize for the nerdy video you're about to see. It's how we are. But <laughs> you, um, BYOD um, opens up so many things that you're probably already aware of. Uh, what people do on their personal <coughs> devices um, gets more and more shocking the deeper you get into IT and you start seeing some of it. Um, some inappropriate, some illegal, some unknown illegal. People do things on their phones that they really don't realize can be tracked. So that information then becomes stuff that is now your responsibility because it's now connected to your network and you say you support it. So how are you protected from that, which may be part of your policy also. 43% um, of companies don't roll out any security strategy, and then less than 10% of organizations are aware of the devices accessing their network. So let me show you what happens. People lose phones a lot. One in 10, no, I got that number. In 10, 10 phones are lost, stolen, or discarded with all of their data on them. So. <clears throat> Time for the nerdy video. There's nothing you need to hear. Unfortunately, we can't get there. That'd be awesome. That would really help the IT department. <laughs> <laughs> The reality is, uh, this, this Spiceworks app, the only reason I use that video from them is simply, it's a tool that we use. Uh, Spiceworks is a fully free tool, but they had some features in there that fit exactly what we're running into, and that is mobile device management. There are so many free tools out there now that allow you to monitor what's happening on devices, and then you add on the top of that, okay, now I want to, I want to be able to wipe the device out. I want to be able to, you know, if somebody loses it, wipe it out. Um, one of our executives recently um, left his phone at a restaurant. And 
he called me and said, I called them, they can't find the phone. What can you do? So I get onto our remote tool and I send a device wipeout command and all I get back is device isn't online. A day and a half later, I get an email saying device was just activated and wiped. So a person had taken the phone, a day and a half later they turned the phone on and because I had a remote device wipe on there, it cleared all the data and he's an executive at our company. We have no idea what was in his email. We don't know what kind of information he had. It was very easily something that could have um, helped competition, hurt our company, hurt him, and it was important to be able to do that. So being able to wipe that data out is important. The, the tools are out there. If you're a small company with one, two, three, four people, there are tools out there that are free that will do this for you. Not wipe the device. You start getting to wipe device, um, if you're a you know Google business user or if you're a Microsoft Office 365 user, they're built into those tools. They give you the ability to wipe out, but if you don't have a monthly service you pay for of some sort, you likely have to purchase a product, but you're talking about a few dollars a month. And the question is, do you want to balance those out over, if I lost this device, how important is it that that data is gone? Uh, by the way, I just, I, was, I forgot that example I told you this morning. I bought a uh, phone for my daughter off of Craigslist and I put the SIM card in it, and I turned it on, and it started downloading somebody's email and information <laughs> and a corporate email. It logged into Microsoft Office email, and I was like, oh, wow, this poor person. Fortunately, I'm an IT person, so I was like, oh, crap, get that off of here before I get in trouble. So I did a factory wipe, but they sold me a phone on Craigslist. The person who sold it to me did not wipe it and sold it to me. So kind of scary thought. Um, and then 35% of employees store work email passwords on their phone. I have a product called Evernote. You guys ever used Evernote? Evernote does a really good security where you can put secure documents where you can keep passwords and information. I have a lot of those on there. Those are stored in my Evernote. They're secure there, but they're on my phone. So if my phone was unlocked and you walked up to it, you can get to those. All of my corporate ones are in, what do we use, Keeper? One called Keeper. We use the Keeper app so we can share it back and forth. That one, you have to have one master password. Oddly, for some reason, somebody decided it would be a great idea to make an application that allows you to make Keeper auto-log in on a phone. I don't have that because I think that's crazy, but you can auto-log into Keeper, which would then give you access to every password you have. So if a person owns their own device, are they trying to make their life easier by doing an auto-log on and not thinking about, oh my gosh, if I lost my phone, <laughs> now I'm in some major trouble. I know I'm talking mostly about phones, but this is true for a lot of devices. Um, and then keep your network secure. Uh, uh, this is kind of cool. 70% of Cisco employees work at least 20% of their work week at home. Uh, HP, that's up at 41st and Mingo area there. They're in the old Sabre Center, the, right by the American. Uh, the vast majority of their employees work at home over 90% of their time. In fact, we have somebody that supports us out of there that does exactly that and for a while lived in Hawaii but reported to his boss who is at that building there. So. Um, and then this is one of those 78% of companies, more than twice as many personal devices connecting to their network than did a year ago. Uh, I did a, didn't have ability to do an analysis that would give me an exact number, but I was a little shocked. I did a run uh, yesterday uh, just to look at our network when I saw this stat and said, what? How many are connected to ours? The majority of our devices that were connected to our network that I didn't know said Android or iPhone on them. It, there was huge number. It was over half of the devices were Android iPhone, not PCs that we put in the building. And by the way, with my phone, I can use the VPN or virtual private networking from this network here and get into my office on my phone that I personally own because I have a password to the network. So there are a lot of, um, lot, of, lot of things you can do. How about applications? Applications you want to put in your, on your device. I mentioned a couple of them that allow you to kind of override security. The applications that you can run that can override security are super helpful. Uh, there's a lot that do... Um, there's a lot that transfer information. There's a lot uh, banking apps. None of you guys, was anybody a banker, banker in here? I don't remember a banker. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of banking apps for depositing checks that are personally done. They don't, they're obviously super secure between the device and the place that they deposit. But for instance, um, the bank that I use, I can do an auto deposit um, from my phone. I can take a picture of the check and it does the deposit. Uh, if I scroll through my, if I open up a file browser and I scroll through my phone, the pictures of my checks are in a temp folder in that phone. So I don't know who wrote the app, but the app does not delete them from the device itself, probably until a reboot or a reload or something, but the last four checks that I deposited were on my phone. <clears throat> so I now have set up a thing that wipes that folder out every day because I know, but most users don't know that. So again, 
something you want to do. Uh, there's a kind of a fun reference to Angry Birds in here. At the same time that you want to make people not have applications that are unsecure, you also don't want people um, not able to use their devices for personal use. The statistic was, and I'm guessing now, I think it was 4%, um, only 4% of people say they use more than 30, 30 minutes a day on their mobile device for personal things. Um, interesting statistic. 11% of end users access business applications from the corporate office 100% of the time. That means 89% of people do some type of business access. There it goes. Did it go? Okay. Um, from outside. Um, oh, yes. I'm so glad it came back up. Uh, iPhone 4S and iPad jailbreaking. When you jailbreak a, a mobile device, there's a lot more apps that can do non-security things. People who jailbreak apps generally have a purpose. Sometimes it's a game, sometimes it's some kind of uh, technical thing they want to do. Usually with an iPhone, it's a technical thing. Um, the, the reason nerds like to use the um, Android devices are there's a lot of, lot of network type tools, there's a lot of security type tools, there's a lot of control of servers that you can do with Androids that you can't do directly out of an iPhone. Jailbreak that iPhone, you can do all those things. So a lot of technical people who have technical knowledge jailbreak their phones and they're on your network. So do you know for sure what they're doing? And this is interesting, one, one million downloads in one 24 hour period of the jailbreak apps. So, uh, and then here's the don't, bring, don't uh, ban angry birds. If you have a bring your own device and you choose to use a tool that controls what they can install, you can stop them from installing anything. So you can say, no games. Well then what's gonna happen is users are gonna go, well, I'm just not gonna read email. I'm just gonna get rid of my corporate email. Generally, those tools are attached to your email. Mm -hmm. When you install, like if you've ever installed a corporate email on your phone, it'll say, this app requires additional control of your device. That means don't look now, I'm gonna wipe you out if you quit. <laughs> that's what that really means. So that's what they're saying. You know, Make sure you, you do allow some openness if you have control. If you hire an outside company to do this, you wanna be careful with it. Well, thank you, Jen. All right. Yeah. And let's, I think Jen's gonna... Thank you.